What role do your genes have in the length of your life? If they have a tremendous effect, which I would guess that you suspect that they do, then can we influence those genes? And are there genes that you can test in yourself to determine if you have a genetic advantage? Well, that's what we're going to uncover today. We'll be using a video released by The Economist as the backbone of our investigation, but I'll take you much deeper into your cells and show you exactly how your genes influence your longevity. Let's begin. In the 1990s, Cynthia Kenyon made headlines when her groundbreaking work with roundworms showed for the first time that genes can play a part in aging. Amazingly, we found that changing a gene called DAF2 could in one fell swoop double the lifespan of the animal and cause it to age much more slowly than normal so that it stayed young much longer than normal. Okay, so manipulating genes seems to have an impact on extending lifespan, rather massively, I would say. A doubling in life? <laughs> Still, I don't know if you've taken a biology class before, but or just looked at yourself in the mirror, but I'd guess that you likely have a strong suspicion that you aren't a worm. But <laughs> there's quite some good news on that front, because this particular gene, DAF, is also found in humans, but let's listen on. Since then, scientists have tweaked various genes in roundworms, resulting in mutants that can live to over five months old, 10 times longer than those without the genetic changes. We now know from work from our lab and from other labs that the reason that this gene change slows down aging is because the genes that we changed are involved in a kind of programmed system of resiliency. They make the animals less sensitive to pathogens. They improve the ability of the animal to repair its DNA, all sorts of things. It's pretty amazing. They're the same changes responsible for increasing lifespan in near starving animals. Only this time, the animal can eat as much as it wants because its genes have been tricked into thinking it's starving. And humans have the genes, they're right there in us, but we don't yet know whether they affect our lifespan or not. Well, let's explore what research has been done on DAF, and then I'd like to expand on some of the other genes. So to illustrate their point, here's some of the data on the DAF gene mutations. The line that extends way out there are the worms with the DAF gene mutation. So they weren't lying in the video, what a relief. That said, however, notice that the DAF2 plus DAF18 double mutation leads to a loss of that lifespan extension effect. This shows that not all genes extend lifespan, and some can get in the way of the initial benefit. So we have to find the correct genes to manipulate. But let's stop focusing on the worms and let's look at humans. There are ortholog genes in humans, meaning that there are genes that are shared between species. And one of those genes is FOXO, or foxhead box protein O1. We're sticking to FOXO though. FOXO is a transcription factor, meaning that it is a protein found in the cytosol of your cells that, when activated, will move into the nucleus of your cells, where your genes are kept and bind them to be read. So as a transcription factor, it is regulated by upstream molecules. These molecules, proteins, influence the activity of FOXO to be active or inactive. One potent mechanism of FOXO inactivity is the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. Essentially, as insulin or insulin-like growth factor bind to the exterior of the cell, there's an activation of a cascade of enzymes within the cell, with the main players being PI3K or PI3 kinase. This enzyme, once activated, will activate another protein, another enzyme, called PDK, which will further activate an enzyme called AKT. AKT then deactivates FOXO, keeping FOXO in the cytosol and away from acting on the genes inside the nucleus. This action impedes the longevity gene expression. 
From the FOXO activation standpoint, if any of the enzymes upstream of FOXO are inhibited, this allows FOXO free reign to enter the nucleus and bind genes, acting as a transcription factor as we discussed. So how does that translate in a longevity effect? Well, the genes that FOXO binds leads to the transcription or gene reading machinery to be recruited to that gene and in short, create a new protein from that gene. That protein will then go on to be used in a variety of healthy cellular effects like autophagy and proteasome degradation. Again, in short, these cellular mechanisms degrade and destroy dysfunctional components of the cell. As we age, our proteostasis or the, the balance of functional proteins is impeded, where we accrue more and more proteins that are mutated or dysfunctional in some capacity. So, Having something like the ubiquitin proteasome system, which will tag these proteins for degradation and then gobble them up, that's, that's the scientific term, gobble them up, to el eliminate them from interfering with the regular cellular processes is extremely helpful. But FOXO doesn't just stimulate gene expression of autophagy and the proteasome system. It also actually allows antioxidant genes to be expressed more readily keeping the oxidative stress burden in the cell lower as these antioxidants will interact with damaging oxidant molecules and neutralize them. Also, FOXO controls the stem cell population in our body. It acts as a control of the stem cell population by encouraging stem cell production in certain instances, but keeping the stem cell population numerous. This is a delicate balance because stem cells have the ability to multiply and turn into just about any other cell that the body needs. However, if the body pushes stem cell differentiation, meaning the stem cells leaves its stemness and becomes a new cell, like uh, an intestinal cell or an immune cell or whatever, then we end up with fewer stem cells over time. This is a hallmark of aging. But our stem cells have the ability to replicate, meaning new stem cells can be made from one cell and then one of those cells can differentiate into the cell that the body needs, the intestinal cell, kidney cell, etc. That maintains the stem cell pool through replication and still allows the body the cells that it needs through differentiation. Okay, so FOXO has a hand in reading genes that allow that to happen, and the loss of FOXO leads to the stem cell pool being depleted prematurely. There are a ton of different ways that FOXO has an effect on longevity and aging, and at the end of this video, I'll tell you about some genetic tests that can be done to see if you have some of the good FOXO in your body. But for now, you should understand that there are genes that play a major role in aging. We've discussed one, and not even in its entirety, because there's so much more to say. But there are also other genes that are also important for longevity. It isn't limited to FOXO. Unfortunately, this video would be about three days long if we went even over a minority of them. So let's discuss another aspect of genetics that is far more modifiable, let's say. Researchers have discovered other genes that affect aging in humans, but changing genes in people is irreversible. A more practical way to slow aging would be to change not genes themselves, but how they're read, modifying something called the epigenome. Epigenetics literally means on top of genes. So you can think of it as a layer of information that are added to the DNA. The epigenome tells genes when to turn on and off. There is a very promising um, therapeutic avenue that is being investigated now called epigenetic reprogramming. Tweaking the epigenome of mice has already shown it's possible to turn back a cell's biological clock, in particular manipulating four proteins known as Yamanaka factors. And if you express those Yamanaka factors in old cells, they change the epigenome and push the cell back in time. Epigenetic treatments are showing so much potential that research money is flooding in. Startups betting they can modify the epigenome to slow down aging are popping up all over Silicon Valley and elsewhere. That's right. 
Epigenetics. What we're talking about here is a modification of the gene that doesn't require a hard modification, like removing a piece of DNA from the gene, like we'd see with a mutation. Our DNA are coiled around proteins called nucleosomes, which are themselves made of proteins called histones. If the DNA is coiled around the histone tightly, then the genes made of those DNA pieces are less likely to be read, expressed. However, if they are in a loose configuration, the genes are more easily read. This process is controlled by epigenetics. You may have heard of the uh, sirtuin proteins. One of the functions of these sirtuin proteins, these uh, enzymes, is to remove tags from the histones. Removing the tags, known as acetyl tags, influences the tightness of the binding of the DNA, closing or opening the genes to be read. So without actually affecting the gene structure itself, the gene is now more prone to being read or not. There are other examples of this like methylation, which directly bind to the DNA. These methyl tags are added by a family of enzymes called DNA methyltransferases. Uh, the addition of these tags leads to, again, increased reading binding of transcription factors or the dissuading of transcription factors to bind. Let's look at an example of epigenetic factors. As we just talked about, certain epigenetic tags can close DNA from being read because it enters a tight configuration. The technical term for this is called heterochromatin. So when histones are methylated, one of the tags that we talked about, uh, they can enter this heterochromatin state specifically if they are trimethylated, meaning that they have three methyl tags attached. This trimethylation recruits a protein called the heterochromatin binding protein, or HBP. That then binds at the site of the epigenetic tag and locks it into the heterochromatin structure, essentially locking away the genes from being read. We see changes in this occurring over age, as seen here. There are human cells that are probed for the amount of heterochromatin binding protein, written as HP1 here. The vertical axis is the number of cells with this protein. The horizontal axis is determined by how much of this protein is present. And the left is less, and to the right is more. The different colors correspond to different stages of the cell's life. As you can see, in the early life, seen in blue, most of the cells have low levels of this protein. However, in later life, green, the cells that express the protein tend to express more of it. Essentially, we see a shift in this expression with time. Now, imagine if there were some longevity genes locked up in there. That would make quite the difference. Again, this is one example of literally tens of thousands, but you get the point. Epigenetics play a major role. So, what are some of the takeaways here? Well, genes are impossible to change without actual genetic manipulation, which requires a scientist insane enough to put themselves in prison for life. Although I have done it in cells, I refuse to do it on you, so please don't contact me. But we know how to take advantage of the genes that are present, have them expressed more or less readily through the activation of molecules like FOXO or epigenetic changes. So how do we do that? Well, being able to keep insulin levels lower is one way. For example, people heading towards diabetes tend to have higher baseline insulin levels. I also discussed some methods in some of the videos in this series, like the video on calorie restriction, which, by the way, all the videos of this series will be linked for you, or just search for any videos with the this tag in the thumbnail. That said, some other methods aren't revolutionary. Guess what? Exercise blows most things away. What? This is breaking news. <laughs> but look, I did mention some FOXO genes to look into. With genetic tests, you can actually determine if you have more favorable FOXO genes. According to these scientists, there is an association between the much longer life and specific mutations in the FOXO gene. For example, mutations in these regions, I'll post them on screen for you, of the FOXO3A gene was strongly linked to an almost 20 year difference in lifespan. There are plenty of other examples as well, but it's easy to find out. Just take a genetic test and once you get the raw data back, look for those mutations called single nucleotide polymorphisms in these regions. 
If you have them, there's a strong possibility that you're genetically gifted. Pretty cool, right? But listen to this. While a drug that can fight aging at the DNA level remains closer to theory than practical application, other methods of turning back the biological clock already exist. For the past few years, I've been endeavoring to build the world's best anti-aging protocol. That's right. We're going to get into that protocol in the upcoming videos, which I will link the next one right here. Speak with you there.